Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another conference of our series, uh, Hablemos de Física, let's talk about physics. Uh, this time we have the, the pleasure and the privilege of having with us uh, Professor Rainer Blatt from the University of Innsbruck. Professor Blatt is an uh, internationally recognized expert on uh, experimental quantum computing and, and quantum information. His, his uh, achievements are, are, are too many and uh, all kinds of, uh, of course, rec recognition and, and prizes. And uh, uh, here with me is uh, Professor Miguel Angel Martin Delgado from the Theoretical Physics uh, Department, uh, who, as uh, is customary, he will make a more uh, detailed introduction of the, of the uh, achievements and the career of Professor Blatt. What I have to say is that um, uh, Professor Blatt, uh, I mean, the main reason for his visit is actually that tomorrow, as you probably know, he is going to be invested uh, doctorate honoris causa by the University Complutense. Uh, this is actually a, a proposal of this uh, faculty. So the Faculty of Physics proposed this, uh, this uh, honor, this distinction, uh, initiated by the Theoretical Physics uh, Department. And actually, Professor Miguel Ángel Martín Delgado is going to pronounce tomorrow the laudation of this, uh, of this ceremony. So this uh, proposal is based on the, of course, on, on the many merits and achievements of uh, Professor Blatt, but also is, is based on the strong links that he has with uh, Complutense University through many uh, collaborations and, and contacts, including, of course, the, the group of uh, Professor Martin Delgado. So uh, he's coming to receive this distinction, but he has been so kind as to, apart from that, apart from the speech that he will pronounce tomorrow, today he will come here, has come here to give us the opportunity to learn about his, his work for students and for staff. So Professor Clark, thank you very much for being here. Congratulations for your distinction. Very well deserved one, I have to say. And uh, for you, everybody, uh, I hope that you enjoy the, the talk, which is going to be certainly, I think, very interesting. The title is, uh, as you see, The Quantum Way of Doing Computations. I mean, it couldn't be more uh, interesting. And uh, we'll pass now the, uh, the floor to Miguel Angel. We will say a more few words. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, well, I will be very, very brief, just one minute, because we are here to listen to Rainer Blatt. Uh, I met Rainer Blatt uh, some time ago when I visited for the first time uh, the University of Innsbruck in, on occasion of, of a meeting in 2007, and since then we have been <coughs> uh, having several uh, uh, meetings and eventually collaborating closely. Uh, for you to get an idea of uh, his work, he is uh, renowned in uh, quantum optics, uh, atomic physics, and uh, metrology, quantum information and quantum computation. One of his uh, main achievements is to, to have been able to realize the, the components, the basic components to build a quantum computer. And now uh, his uh, major effort is to put them all, all of them together in order to, to, to build one of the, the, the quantum computers that uh, are now uh, in running in, in the world. In particular, he is the leader, the coordinator of the European initiative to build a quantum computer based on trap ions, and that will be part of, of his talk. So, uh, another achievement that he has been uh, doing in, the, in his career, he has been able to tele, tele, teletransport uh, quantum matter atoms for the first time. And he has been uh, able to produce the first uh, quantum byte. And uh, similarly with quantum simulation, making uh, the, the dream of Richard Feynman come true. In a recent experiment, he has performed a proof of concept uh, uh, experimental demonstration of a lattice gauge theory with real-time dynamics. And uh, the list goes on and on and will go on and on. So, without further ado, let me pass the, the turn to, to Rainer and let us uh, uh, listen to his uh, presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, let me thank uh, the two speakers for this kind introduction 
and thank you all for this kind invitation. It's a real pleasure and an honor to be here and to give you uh, some information about what we have been doing over the last, say, two decades in order to realize what I uh, coined here as the quantum way of doing computations. The workhorse, as you will see later, is an ion trap. This is a, one of the more uh, recent models. It's a precision ion trap that could also be used for clocks and uh, metrology, but we'll come back to that later on in the course of this uh, talk. So let me see whether this works. It was supposed to work. Here we go. And uh, this is the menu of today's talk. I would like to start by showing you the progress that we have seen in the past decades on computers and technology. And then I would briefly like to, aunt, uh, to address the question, why do we actually need, why do we want to have quantum computers? Uh, we do have to deal with bits uh, and pieces, that's quantum bits, quantum registers, quantum gates, how to realize eventually a quantum computer. And uh, the realization concepts are manifold. I will briefly talk about that. That will make up for the first 20, 25 minutes. So this is a very general introduction to the field as I see it. And feel free if you, to interrupt me at any time if I uh, should be too complicated or whatever, just ask questions. I'm happy to address this. In the second part of my talk, I would like to delve into more what we do, uh, what quantum computation concerned is with the trapped ions. This is the tool that we have. And in the end, I would like to show you what the quantum toolbox is that we have. And finally, just to give you two examples on quantum simulations, both in the analog, digital, and finally in the variational variety. Uh, there probably won't be time enough to talk about scaling of the ion trap quantum computer. We can just defer this then to discussion. Everything, as said before, happens at the University of Innsbruck, but in conjunction with the Institute of Quantum Optics and Quantum Information of the Austrian Academy of Science. And there's, of course, many sponsors that we have here. So let's just start out uh, with the, goodness, this is really sluggish, um, with a few quotations uh, to begin with. If we just look at the magazine, which is called uh, Popular Mechanics, that's a magazine in the United States, it still exists, that there's an issue of March 1949. Uh, this is only a little older than I am. And it says there, where a calculator on the ENIAC is equipped with 18,000 vacuum tubes and weighs 30 tons, computers in the future may have only 1,000 tubes and weigh only one and a half tons. I would not have been able to bring my computer today if that were the case. Uh, so you've seen the advances are quite uh, manifold and there's, a, uh, there's quite a lot to be improved. But even in 1986, which is not that long ago, nobody else but Richard Feynman said, we ought to be even more ridiculous later and consider bits written on one atom instead of the present 10 to the 11 atoms. Such nonsense is very entertaining to professors like me. I hope to find it interesting and entertaining also. And I would like to keep you entertained at least for the next 45 to 50 minutes. If not, just raise your hand and tell me. Then we'll try to uh, change that. Okay, so let's... Uh, <laughs> Let's go and try to uh, visit uh, how we describe the progress in technology. This is something that you all know. And this is usually described in terms of, uh, so say, Gordon Moore's law or short Moore's law. Gordon Moore was one of the founding fathers of the Intel Corporation, uh, producing chips a long time ago. And he empirically formulated the law, how this progress is actually happening. He took the data in the early 60s and he drew the number of transistors per die as a function of the year. And initially this was just empirically formulated, but then later on it served as the roadmap for the semiconductor industry. Why? Because if you want to make computers faster, you have to make them smaller. You have to downsize the system and to go to chips. But for this to work, the semiconductor industry needs tools like lithography, like uh, optical tools, whatever, to really manufacture these. And so this roadmap served, served then for almost 40, 50 years and more. And you see this follows the straight line, whether that's for memories, for, trans for uh, microprocessors or whatever, for arrays. And uh, Gordon Moore was the first to recognize already decades ago, no exponential, this is a semi-logarithmic plot, no exponential goes forever, works forever. We can actually draw this in a different way. And the different way, okay, I should be closer to the computer here, um, that is 
data that I took from Rob Keyes. He was a uh, collaborator, he was, I think, working with IBM at the time when he just drew this line. And what he did is he just calculated how many atoms do I actually need in order to realize a single classical bit of information. And of course, according to Moore's law, this of course goes down in the same molecular logarithmic plot as a function of the year. And you see this follows the straight line. I took the liberty to calculate how many atoms you need, for instance, on a dial like a Pentium 4, or the 22 nanometer transistor, or then the 40 nanometer transistor, and the 12 nanometer transistor is round about here. It's uh, the same thing. So this is rolling off. If you were naively so interpolating that and then extrapolating things to this, then you would see that already around two, now, 2017, 18, we would have the situation that a single atom must suffice to really realize a single classical bit of information. Now it's very clear, even long time before that, that we need, of course, quantum mechanics to describe this. So let's then ask the question, why do we want quantum computers? The generic answer for that would be, of course, there must be some applications in physics and mathematics, but what are these? The, all, the, the, this, the whole field actually started sort of to take uh, uh, speed and momentum in 1994 when Peter Shaw from AT&T, he uh, came up with an algorithm that he showed that you are much faster on a quantum computer in the following problem. When you factor, uh, say, a number of L digits, in a classical computer, the efforts that you need to factorize this number grow exponentially with the length of the number. But on a quantum computer, if you had one, he showed that this grows only polynomially. And that, of course, was the division early on, and it would endanger, say, quantum, uh, say, some classical crypto cryptography protocols and things like that. And so quite a few agencies got involved, uh, and people started to put in money to that. A little later, in 1997, Love Grower from Lucent Technologies, he came up with another quantum algorithm where he could show that if you have an unsorted database, like for instance a telephone book, uh, this is sorted of course names and telephone number, but if you ask for, an, if you know the phone number and you, have, and you want to know the name, the worst case you have to sort it from A to Z, on average it's, uh, a, it's, it's N over 2, and uh, this is the order of N that you have to search. But uh, if you had a quantum computer, he showed that you could live with the search across, say, a number of a square root of that number. That's a huge effort uh, less than you would need with a quantum computer. So these two basic algorithms and the underlying algorithms here are still the most basic ones. Uh, raised the interest. There was something discussed already in the in the 80s by Feynman. I think I should move over there because this computer is not very responsive. Uh, it's about the simulation of Schrodinger equations. And this currently is a hot topic. I'll come back to that a little later in my talk. And this is something which is more physics related, but very important for the future development of the field. And right now it's a very hot topic. Something that's usually not so often seen is what I would call um, the application to metrology and sensing. And this was pointed out early on by the team of Dave Weinland and others. They just realized that you could use a quantum computer as what they call an atomic state synthesizer. That is to say, you can create at the push of a button with a program a state, a quantum state, that is much more uh, sensitive with respect to certain areas, say accelerations, masses, whatever you have, than a classical state. And that, of course, is has long gone unnoticed. Right now, the metrology field uh, sees this now, and I think personally that this is going uh, a large field of applications. I don't have the time to go into that, but we'll uh, see this as a big piece of the game. And finally, of course, what I call is the quantum physics with the information guided eye. What do I mean with that? When we just look at the field of how information processing has uh, has developed in a classical way. We we'll see the definition of entropies and Shannon's way instead of von Neumann's way and other things, error correction and things like that. We now have a renewed view on quantum physics. So for example, just the notion of error correction was not considered in quantum physics at all because everybody thought when I do a measurement, whether it's intended or inadvertently, it really destroys my quantum coherence and it doesn't work. 
But we know now that this works, and so we can look at quantum physics with renewed IDI. And all of these numbers, all of these issues here, are very important for us to study quantum computers and actually build one. Now the question then is, what is actually needed for a quantum computer? And here I've listed uh, the requirements as they were put together by this gentleman. This is David DiVincenzo. And to has put that together in the late 90s, and this is a paper from the early 2000s, where all of these criteria, as we call them now, are listed. First of all, I need for the, such an approach a scalable physical system, which is characterized of quantum bits, which also we want to start from an arbitrary input state, so we need the ability to initialize the state of the quantum bits to arbitrary input states. Of course, we want to carry out longer calculations, so we need long coherence times, which are much longer than the individual gate operation time, and eventually we want to have a universal computer, so we need a set of quantum gates which is universal in the sense that it can implement every algorithm that you want. And finally, you have to retrieve classical information, so you need a measurement capability which is specific to the respective implementation. A little later, David came up with two more criteria because as nowadays is usually the case, you need networking capabilities. So you need to be able to exchange the quantum information between one node and the next node. So it's the interfacing capability. That's what we call the ability to interconvert stationary and flying qubits. The flying qubit could be something that's really transported from point A to point B, or it's a photon usually that goes over a fiber uh, or a transmission link uh, that you can really use to transport that quantum information. And of course, you need the ability to faithfully transmit the flying qubits because if they are absorbed, you don't gain anything between the specified locations. This is by now known as the seven commandments for quantum computers. So let's see. Uh, we need bits and pieces to realize this. These quantum bits and pieces are the following. We start out from a classical bit, which is for us a physical object in the state zero or state one. That's our usual switch, as you all know it. But then, of course, we need to form registers. These are bit rows like in any ordinary processor, so 32 bits or 64 bits as we have them now. The quantum bit is nothing else but the generalization of that in quantum mechanical terms. So this is our good old fashioned two level system. We take two levels that we can put in the superposition. That's why we write it in quantum mechanics. And in a pictorial representation, we usually make use of what we call the Bloch sphere or in photon language, it's a Poincaré sphere. So you just have an arrow pointing somewhere, and the two angles that determines that are just the coefficients C0 and C1 that you have here. Now we form from that a quantum register by just taking L of these two level atoms, which of course then describe two to the L quantum states, as in the classical case. But if we write down the general state of that as a superposition, as it's written down here, we have to make use of very many coefficients that go into this in order to really describe this. And this is the point that you have to do in any classical computer when you just uh, try to do this in a classical computer to, to, to describe the superpositions. And of course, this grows exponentially. Let me just see. It should be here. <clears throat> so let's just um, look at that. If you have one qubit, then of course, it's just two states and two pathways. But if you have, say, uh, more atoms like this, then this grows as 2 to the n. So in other words, superpositions are the wave-like description that we have for quantum mechanics. So we have to live then with interference patterns. And what the result is, is essentially in the interference pattern that produces the outcome of a computation. And here is the real heart of a quantum computer. Because this is of course, working in the parallel because you just change it in one piece and due to the fact that you have superposition, this changes everywhere. And uh, you already can see the 64 qubits, I would have 10 to the 19 and more computational pathways available that result then in a constructive or destructive interference pattern that shows us the result. This is mind boggling for the following reason. If you just take, say, 300 qubits, then the number of these computational pathways exceeds the number of atoms in the universe. I have no clue what that actually means. I have a hunch, and we can discuss this later on, maybe in the discussion. There is something missing. But this is mind-boggling if you think of it. 300? We are not talking about megabytes, gigabytes, and whatever. We are just talking about a few hundred uh, uh, qubits that we need in order to do that. But of course, there's no free lunch. Uh, don't get me wrong. 
you need to control the interference pattern. You need to control that many interference ways, which is not easy, but this can be done, as I'll show you. Okay? So now we are done with the bits and pieces. Now we have to go to the gate operations. The first thing that we need to do is a so-called one-bit rotation. So we need to be able to tilt uh, that, or to, uh, that uh, vector about arbitrary angles, and also we need to position it at arbitrary positions any way we like. This is a single-bit rotation. That's how it's called on the block sphere. But more importantly, if, in order to break down an algorithm, we need to make if-then decisions. An if-then decision is usually made in computer science by the analog of the, uh, the, the, the classical XOR operation, the Boolean XOR operation. And this is the truth table of the Boolean XOR, as computer scientists know, as all students know that, of course, for a long time. But it's written here in what we call the Parquet notation. So for the physics students, we know this is the quantum mechanic uh, description. What does that mean? It really means that uh, this operation, meaning uh, whenever a, a controlling bit is set to 1, the target bit is supposed to be flipped. <coughs> that has to hold not just for probabilities and for uh, the system uh, point, uh, pointing up and down, as in classical system, it has to hold for superpositions. That's the hard part. So that is something we need to realize. The good part, the good message, is that it was shown in the mid-90s, that these two operations already comprise a completely universal set. So whenever you are able to realize these operations, then you can actually build a quantum computer. So that's the next set of things that we need, which immediately uh, then leads us to a blueprint of the quantum computer. We have to start with superpositions, as indicated before, and then we have a quantum process, and we end with superpositions. And the quantum process, of course, is now breaking down broken down into sequences of two qubit and one qubit operations, of course a sequence of which would be given to you by a programmer who breaks down the algorithm that you have on the investigation into a sequence of these gate operations. And finally, of course, you have then that uh, resulting superposition that doesn't yield you uh, uh, classical information. In fact, you could just reverse it and you have not gained anything. So well, let's just go forward and now we just gain classical information by making a measurement on this register. And the measurement would reveal, say, one of the possibilities here. So you might have to run this uh, two or three times in order to see what the outcome really is, because quantum mechanics is a statistical theory, uh, but it really then results in what, what we have here. Okay, that's it. Then we have a number of realization concepts. And what are these? If you really want to know more about this, I would refer you to the so-called uh, roadmaps, as we also call them. The US roadmap is unfortunately no longer continued. It has some good information in terms of the, uh, the Vicenzo criteria. And the European roadmap is uh, still continued by a large consortium in Europe, and you find a lot of information there, which goes way beyond what's available and what's necessary for quantum computers. But if you really want to know where quantum technologies are supposed to go, I think I have to refer you to that one. Let's come back to realization concepts for quantum computers. I'm going to talk to, uh, to you about ion drops a little later, but in any case, you need the atoms to be localized somewhere. So you have neutral atoms and drops, optical drops, lattices, micro drops. You can have neutral atoms and some cavity QED experiments for the photons that take the information between them. NMR and liquids has shown some time ago, superconducting qubits come in various flavors and charge, flux, and phase qubits. There are some solid state concepts like spin system, quantum dots, and others. There are some optical qubits and some linear optics quantum computation. So this is a more exotic things for photonics and more exotic things right here. All in all, the most important part is that you need quantum systems that can be precisely controlled and manipulated. This is what you need to do. If you cannot do it, you cannot build a quantum computer. So this, whatever you do, if you find another system, check it out. This is what you need to do. Over the last, say, 10, 15 years, uh, the wheat has been uh, separated from the staff, and most of these things right now are pursued for quantum computers, ion drops, neutral atoms, some superconducting qubits, and solid state concepts. Other things are shown to work to a certain extent, but they might be used for specialized purposes, not necessarily for a mainstream universal quantum computer, but uh, there are valid assumptions, uh, valid uh, things that you could do. So let me concentrate from now on on the ion trap concept because we are doing this in Innsbruck, and, but other things can be just cast in the same language and you find the same issues in other things as well. Though the concept 
of using trapped ions for a quantum computer goes back to these two uh, gentlemen, uh, Ignacio Sirac, who you know very well here from Madrid, and Peter Zoller came up uh, with the concept in that famous paper in 1995 in Innsbruck. And I was part of uh, the, 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 them, I had been working with them for a long time, and we had the quantum mechanics and the, the quantum optics ready to treat this. But they actually showed, by using ions and lasers in a precise way, how this CNOT gate operation can be realized. This was the hard part. I mean, individually pointing a laser to an ion is, was clear, and then you can make the single qubit operations, the rotations, but the CNOT gate, that's the equivalent of the classical XOR, is more difficult, and that's what's shown in this paper. Later, there were other approaches possible by all of these authors, some geometric phases and that we are using today, but in any case, this is the basis that made it. And before I go and show you how this works, let's just go and understand the ingredients, back to the bits and pieces. With ions, we have the following qubits. A qubit, as said before, is a two-level system, and the two-level systems come in varieties with the atom species that we have. Now, in uh, these ions, these are the alkaline earth ions, of course, they're hydrogen-like, we often find states that are the low states above the ground state, due to relativistic reasons that are very stable, though this lifetime is about one second in calcium, and I'll show you experiments with the so-called optical qubit right here. This is our two-level system. But you can also use two-level systems of this variety, a Seyman manifold or a hyperfine manifold, and this usually requires then that you use Raman transitions instead of a single uh, uh, laser, for example, pointing here. These things have been investigated in many other labs as well, also in our lab. Uh, I will only be able to talk about things today about this one, but everything I'm saying can be applied and has been applied in the same way without just replacing this single laser by, say, a two Raman lasers right here. What is the tool? In order to keep the atoms in situ, you, we have to have a, what we call a trap. This trap derives from the so-called Powell mass filter. Uh, for those who are working in experimental physics, they know this is a machine with which you can guide a beam of ions through this uh, arrangement of electrodes, and you provide uh, voltages, uh, AC and DC voltages of a certain frequency, uh, such that the only mass-selected beam goes through. We can keep that mass-selected particles in the center by winding rings around it, so they are getting trapped in the side, there, in this piece, in this uh, volume right here. But you also can replace these uh, rings then by end segments, this is called a segmented trap. We can replace the end segments by tips, that gives you some spit, stiffer confinement. You can see the various places where they have been used and invented, and you can actually combine them. And in the end, I'm showing you also some chip traps that we have developed recently. So there's a variety of things, that's the principle. And this is what I call our Millennium Trap. This is still the workhorse that we're using in Innsbruck, aside from many others. But just to show you how this really looks like, this is a picture of that one. The tip distance is about six millimeters. And the distance between these the, the electrodes right here, the gap is about one millimeter. And for any good harmonic oscillator, and this is going to be a harmonic oscillator, we need to describe, and that's all you need to keep in mind for this talk, the frequency of motion. A harmonic oscillator in the C direction, which is the X direction between these two tips, has a frequency of about 1 megahertz, and the other ones in the lateral direction, they're about 2 megahertz, depending on the voltage that you apply. That's all you need to remember. Now, back to the Sirac solar idea, and here's the key feature. We know now how to encode qubits in one of these transitions, and we have a state vector that is, of course, given by the L ions. But that state vector, of course, describes then the internal degrees of freedom, that is the internal degree of freedom of all of these two level systems that we have here, sitting side by side. And this is the Sirac solar idea. We just have to describe that with a common motion. The CM stands for center of mass motion. Meaning the following. If you have the ions right here, they of course are moving, and like coupled pendula due to the Coulomb repulsion, these ions are moving. There's various modes, and we are talking now about the center of mass motion. That's precisely the motion where all of these ions are moving, like a swing back and forth, like a, a Newton cradle. And the idea of you see, Peter and Ignacio was the following. Let's put this in the ground state of the harmonic oscillation. Really the ground state. Nothing classical. It's really the ground state of it. Why? Their idea was the following. We want to realize this truth table. That means that whenever this ion has an excited state amplitude, this ion is supposed to flip. 
But how the heck should that I know about the excited state amplitude here? So we have to convey this. And the way to convey is, and that's the precise idea of Ignacio and Peter, is the following. We just point the laser to this one, make a single qubit rotation, but in such a way that we map the internal degree of freedom, that's the excited state of state, i.e. number two, right here, to a one of the center of mass motion. I'll show you in a minute how to do this. Once we have that, then that single ion starts to move back and forth. But due to the coupling, of course, all of a sudden the entire chain starts to move. So from the point of view of the chain, you don't know which ion had received that phonon. So the phonon belongs to the entire chain. This not knowing is something that we call in quantum mechanics entangled. So we have entangled the internal degree of freedom of one atom with the motion of the entire string. Now, I can go to the second ion right here and make a transition if and only if there was a one in the center of mass motion. Otherwise, I don't do anything. I'll show you in a minute how to do it. Once this is achieved, then of course I've done what I needed because I flipped my spin. Then I go back to the first ion, I take the one out and replace it with an internal degree of freedom right here. So I just have concluded the entire truth table. This requires individual addressing, some efficient single qubit operations for each of these operations. Of course, it requires small decoherence of internal and emotional states, otherwise you would get completely out of coherence and would fail. And eventually, a quantum computer then needs to be realized as a series of gate operations that's a sequence of these laser pulses. That's what we need to do. So, now we know how, in principle, this works. How does it look in practice? In practice, this is the really the trap that we have that I showed you before and you want to know more the details right here I have to refer you to that paper that's the latest performance check and we have a string of designs which are illuminated by light red and blue light in order to do the optical cooling they are stock still I'll show you how this works in a minute and then we just scatter the blue light right here and see how the system uh, is in such a thing. And if you, you see a, a string appearing, in this case 20 ions, which we use naturally in all of these uh, uh, calculations as the basis, this register or quantum register now for the quantum computer. Now, of course, all of these ions can be individually addressed by focused laser beams when you just come in from the side and you can manipulate the uh, information. Oh, then we're always ready. So let me just show you what the atomic physics is. We have a system, as I showed you before, with an optical transition right here, that's a lifetime of one second. And since this is a, only a single ion, I can detect whether the ion is here or there by shining in laser light here on this so-called dipole allowed transition. Once the electron is in the ground state, then it can shuttle back and forth right here, so we show a bright ion. This is our pseudo spin down for a two-level notation. Or if it's shelved, as David would say, in this state, the electron is no longer available, so it gets projected, and of course the ion is dark. It would be a pseudo spin up. This refers to, we refer to this as a sigma z measurement for obvious reasons. Now, of course, the fluorescence that we see in such a case just shows you the proverbial quantum jumps. The electron is projected to this one, or down there, down here, up here, there, and you see a rectangular thing like this. This is the basis for our detection scheme, and we see this routinely, and it's underlying all of these operations and the detections. Next thing is, we remember that we had a two-level system in the harmonic trap. So quantum mechanically, we have to generalize this, so we just have to write down a Hamiltonian, which has many two-level systems sitting side by side, which are just energetically different by the trap frequency nu that I have here. But that said, that's like a molecule with vibrations. So I have very many ways of uh, uh, getting this laser beam which interacts then with the system into resonance. So for example, if I tune my laser with n phonons of the harmonic oscillator in the ground state to n phonons in the excited state, I'm on the so-called resonant carrier transition. That doesn't affect the motion at all. But I can also tune the laser here, what we call to the lower sideband, meaning that the system absorbs right here and then one can show that the system predominantly decays on this state, climbs down the ladder, until it finally resides in the lowest state, that's the n equals zero state. Remember, this is precisely the state that we need from the Sirac solar idea. We want to start in a precisely known quantum state. Once this is there, one can show that only three transitions are left over. This is what we call the carrier transition. This allows you to 
uh, manipulate the internal degree of freedom, that's the quantum information, or a blue sideband transition which adds a phonon, so it just changes this by one, plus one, or the red sideband transition which changes the phonon number by minus one. So in other words, the internal superpositions are done by the carrier, and the sideband uh, transitions, they generate the entanglement between the motion and qubit, that's the spin motion entanglement if you just res uh, restrict ourselves to a two qubit system, to a two state system that's is described by a spin. Now we are ready. And now we can really do universal quantum computation because we have everything there to uh, make that sequence. And remember, the gate operations are realized by the sequence of laser pulses which are happening on the carrier. On the blue sideband is actually sufficient. Sometimes you use the red sideband as well. But take just these two. How do we analyze things? Knowing what's going on in the system requires that we measure, of course, probabilities of finding the system up or finding the system down. Of course, I can measure now for each individual particle, have you been in the excited state, have you been in the ground state, just by projecting things, that's what I know. But more importantly, I need also to know, is there any coherence between, say, ion 1 and ion 2? And for this to know, I have to measure all the other components as well, meaning that I have to rotate my Bloch sphere by 45 or 90 degrees prior to a measurement and then project. And rotating, projecting, rotating, projecting is known as tomography. That's why we refer to that procedure as a state or process tomography. And the outcome of that is a fingerprint where we just ask ourselves, what is the uh, population that we find in the system? So for example, for this build state, as it is in indicated right here, this is what we get as a fingerprint pattern, and this would be the imaginary part experimentally, which is supposed to be zero. And we have also spectroscopic ways to measure entanglement in the system. Now, what are the toolbox operations that we have? The Sirac solar idea relies heavily on the fact that we have really always uh, prepared the system in its ground state zero. This is not always the case. Sometimes there's leftovers in state one and two, and then we make a lot of errors. So for that reason, we took resort to a different entangling operations, which were uh, originally proposed by Klaus Milmer and Anders Sorensen, and they make use of what we call spectroscopically two photon transitions. A two photon transition just couples ground state and excited state via two photons. There's in one intermediate state. And here you see the intermediate states for, say, two ions in the ground state, which you want to couple to two ions in the excited state, that would give you then the proverbial belt state, can be achieved in the following way. You shine in the light, which is one phonon short, but simultaneously shine in the light as one phonon long. So you just take this, and there's four different possibilities. And as you know, for any good two photon transition, you can achieve that there are first order Doppler free. That's a spectroscopic tool. And the same happens here. You just sum up the probabilities uh, to get from here to there. There's four different pathways. Square it. And then you just uh, uh, get the probability for getting that superposition. And you see that first order contributions of these intermediate states drop out. In other words, this becomes in first order independent of some leftovers of the quantum number in. That's sen insensitive, and this is uh, what we use currently. It's a bichromatic excitation that's used for entangling operations coming from the side. Of course, we need to make resonant manipulations as well. For this, we just shine in the laser on resonance, say with a global laser. Therefore, this we call it the collective yet local operation. And finally, we also can make real local operations by pointing the laser to the individual systems. This would be then done off resonantly, so this is then a stark shift. In short, if for those who are mathematically inclined, and uh, if you're not, just skip the slide, but otherwise, it can be described by unitary operations that really describe the underlying mathematics of the gate operations. This, in a pictorial way, is represented by unitary operation on only one ion, the long ones on many ions, and these are the collective stock shifts, the collective local operations, or the entangling operations, which can be written in mathematical terms as an interaction between two spins spin-spin interactions, double-double interaction, for example. There's many more that we have uh, uh, used and uh, invented over the last, say, 10 years, and I don't have the time to go into this, but uh, it really is su suffices to say that we have a set of gate operations that are overcomplete. So we have more gate operations and, uh, than we actually need. It's more than universal, and we need to optimize this. Just to give you an idea, 
uh, what the picture lo no, looks like. This was the recipe that we had before. And the new recipe looks like that. We are just replacing these gate operations by a different set. But this is now over complete. And in order to figure out a good way for that, uh, we have developed a compiler. MQCO stands for Multi-Qubit Coherent Operations. And this was uh, written in a the PhD thesis of Esteban Martinez, who was a PhD, a PhD student here. He came from Argentina. And he developed this. He took all of these gate operations right here. And then he did the following. Suppose we want to use a quantum operation. This is our quantum computation described by the unitary, as I've shown you before. Then it's, of course, not unique anymore how we break down that unitary in the sequence of the U's that I've shown you before. OK, we can do that to a certain extent. We did this by hand initially. But now we start out with a set of local operations, which is usually not good enough to do this. Then we add another layer which consists of one entangling operation, that's a Mimus gate, and then local operations, and try to figure out, does that work? If it doesn't, then we go to another one. And so forth. The outcome then is essentially that unitary decomposed in a sequence of the basic gate operations. So it's really a compiler that uses now the basic use that we have, like an assembler language. Now, uh, for all of what I'm showing in, uh, in the next few slides, we have used this process, it's underlying, I don't uh, show you that anymore. And we have never used more than two layers. We don't know yet why this converges. And we don't know whether we ever need the third layer. We have never used it. And of course, for those who really want to ask already, this is not a scalable procedure. Because then I would have solved my quantum computer problem at all. Because once I have the unitary, I can invert it and then I can just do it. This just works for the optimization of, say, subroutines, say, small building blocks, and this is how we do it. Just to give you an idea, when you want to use Toffoli gates, the Toffoli gate is a controlled, controlled, not operation, so there's two controls instead of only one. That usually would have to be written down in 60 not operations plus many local operations. But we can do this now, run this through the compiler, and it's only three, one of the expensive entangling gates, the rest is just trivial, and if you have less constraints, or the more constraints, say less information needed, then you just measure that you're not interested in this one that takes even less. And uh, this goes on. In our realization of a scalable Shor algorithm, you can show you need that complicated four controlled knot operation. Uh, you can realize this only with nine pulses. I would not have seen this, how to do this. This was only figured out by a computer because it takes really some decomposition of the gate operations that we have. If you come up with, then, say, a more elegant and better gate operation, we can even reduce this. But this is the toolbox that we have right now. And similarly, if you want to do a swap operation, that's so-called Fretkin gate, this breaks down in a complicated sequence of, say, 18 pulses. But it can be done the same way. OK, in any case, we are ready. Let me conclude this talk by showing you two or three examples of uh, simulations that we do. All of these things have been done. I don't have the time to go into more details. And if you really want to know more, I still refer you to this Bible by Mike and Ike. And it's still very valid and very nice to see these things. When we talk about simulation, what do I mean with that? Quantum simulation of a system that is sometimes too complicated to calculate in a classical computer can then be put on a quantum simulator. And there's two ways of using a quantum simulator. One way would be that you try to use what you have and that you try to reinterpret the operations in such a way that you embed your algorithm in such a way that you run this and uh, see the, the dynamical devolution of the system as a function of time. This is what we call an analog simulation. So we really reinterpret what's going on in the Hamiltonian that we have in our system and just get there. The more precise way would be the digital simulation. That is, you make use of what I've said before. You just make the sequence of all the unitary operations. So you have to break down the entire the dynamical evolution in the sequence of that one. And uh, this is, I think, the better way, because that's the full-blown quantum computation. We call it the universal quantum simulator. But it also uh, requires that you get mastered that one. I'll show you just a few examples. The first one is about analog simulations, which was guided in the lab by Christian and Ben in our lab. And here we make use for some technical reasons of transverse modes. Remember, the iron in the trap has three modes of motion, the x, y, and z direction, while we usually use the center of mass motion uh, for most of these things. For this experiment, we use the transverse motions. That has some technical reasons, but otherwise it's the same. So let's just see how this works. Suppose we had now seven ions in this case. 
And what we want to investigate is this easing Hamiltonian, that's the spin-spin interaction right here, and the interaction with the transverse magnetic field. And it was shown some time ago that you can break down the coupling constants here in an approximate power law. Uh, dependence where alpha equals zero inf means infinite range interactions. Think of this as the ion string talking with a motion to all of the other ones. So you just have an infinite range of that interaction. But if you just uh, do higher order modes, then you can just go to double double interaction. In fact, we were here interested in the case where this last part here is bigger in its interaction strength than the maximum of the JIJ. And then you can recast this by a very simple manipulation and what's called a hopping hard Corboso model with these exchange processes. Now the system now looks as indicated before. We come with a bichromatic beam from the side, but we still keep this beam, which is uh, the addressed here, so that we can do the stark shifts as well. Now with this, we do the following experiments. We first start out with the chain, which is just put in the ground state with all of them pointing in the same direction. And then, of course, uh, we, in, we invert, say, with an address beam, one of the things. That we flip one spiel. In the, in the lingo of these measurements, it's called the local quench. Then we apply the bichromatic beam from the side, meaning we emulate the interaction, the easing interaction, as I've shown you. So the spins talk to each other and evolve in time. And finally, we make a measurements how far they have involved. And you can calculate these things in terms of trap parameters that listed here, not so important. What's the outcome? Let's say these are seven ions at time c equals zero. And then we just inverted the spin and then we apply the Hamiltonian. And then we just make measurements in certain time slices. You see that the magnetic excitation that we have here spreads out, gets reflected, there's interference patterns. And originally, of course, since there was just one ion inverted, there's no entropy right here, there's no entanglement. But once this spreads out, these two ions become entangled, so it generates entanglement, which we can calculate from that. Since we have the possibility to point the laser here and to individually address and measure these things, we can actually measure the populations of these individual spins by tomography and calculate a measure of the entanglement, which is called concurrence, for say ion two, uh, three and five in this case, or for this one and that one, for this one uh, and, and so forth. And when you draw this as a function of time, as the time slices, you see, this is really waves going through the system, like spin waves. The entanglement is propagating through the system in such a way. This is a typical example for dynamical behavior that you can study with such an analog quantum simulation. Now, the next point would be to use a universal quantum simulator with these ions. The universal quantum simulator makes use of the same quantum register here and, of course, the unitaries that we concatenate. This is done also with these senior people here, including Thomas in our lab. What do we want to do? We, of course, want to replace now the entire dynamical process by a sequence of these unitaries. And suppose you want to simulate this Hamiltonian, which, of course, could be cast in that unitary operation, if you just can do that with that system Hamiltonian. Very often, they do not commute with each other, and then you have to resort to an approximation, which is known as a Trotter approximation or Trotter Suzuki approximation, meaning that you just apply this Hamiltonian for a certain time slice, this for a certain time slice, and that, and so forth, and the, you just uh, reply the entire sequence n times. Let me show you how this works in a pictorial way. So this is encoding each unitary in the respective part of the Hamiltonian that you want to simulate. Then you write this down again in the same sequence. I just changed notation to a phase notation right here. And then you repeat this n times. In the pictorial way, this really means you apply this Hamiltonian for a time slice here, the next one, the next one, and then you repeat this n times, and the finer you are, the better this should work. That this is efficient for local quantum systems was shown in this uh, seminal paper by Seth Lloyd already some time ago. Here's an example. If we just take our two-spin easing system, that's easy to see. We have an uh, interaction between two spins and the interaction with the transverse field. And by now you know how to translate this immediately to the operations that we have available in the system. How do we do that? This is the so-called member Sörensen gate, the spin-spin interaction that does the two-photon two entangling gate. And this is the AC stock shift. So we just have to replace this with respective pulses. This is how easy it is. And what we do want to simulate, for example, we just have, we want to study how often do both electrons point up or both electrons point down. So let's do this in the experiment. We just use these time slices. If you have two time slices, you see the fidelity is lousy. 
That's the fidelity value. Instead of 100%, you only get 69%, though the experimental values deviate from the theory values quite substantially. Now let's make these things finer. Everything gets better, though that agrees better. We have finally a fidelity of 85%. And we get yet finer, it's 91%. And if you go still finer, we still remain at 191%. What's the reason? The reason is that you see slight deviations appearing here, or if you look closely here already. We have so many gate operations in order to follow that dynamical behavior that each error that we have with individual gate operations, of course, accumulates to the point that finally the system runs out of steam. The good news is, of course, it can be done. And if you include at this point error correction, which I have no time to go into, then we could error correct each individual step and then, of course, we would be home free. This is the universal quantum computer that you finally want. We're only partially there. I don't have the time to go into that. I do not have much time. Let me just uh, conclude with a few things right here. We have applied these things to open system simulations. We have done this with the, uh, quantum phase transitions in a dynamical way. We have done the full simulation of a lattice gauge theory using it that way. We can also control the entangled states of a fully controlled 20 qubit system. I would like to conclude with a very recent paper. Now this is for the specialists and I'll go through that briefly. Uh, that we just embedded the so-called uh, realized the so-called variational quantum simulation that's uh, experimentally worked out in the PhD thesis of Christina Meyer and the theoretical work was done by PhD thesis Christo, uh, Christian Kokal and uh, postdoc Rick van Beinen, of course, in the uh, theory group by Peter Zoller. The idea is essentially to use now a classical computer here and a quantum computer in a hybrid fashion. How does that work? The idea is that we want to use this in a, in, in, in a sequence. So we just prepare a cron state of a Hamiltonian by minimizing measured Ham uh, expectation values of a test Ham or a target Hamiltonian. The idea is instead of using now the Hamiltonian in a programmed fashion in the quantum computer, just let it live in the classical computer and use now a complex quantum computer to realize a quantum state somewhere and you give a rule how to tap into the Hilbert space there you don't do the computations, you just measure one expectation value. So it's not a full-blown quantum computation, but you make use of the fact that you have a huge uh, facility there to create entangled states, superposition states, whatever you have. You don't have to calculate it otherwise. Then you feed back an expectation value, and then you let the computer go around. Let me just show you how this works. This is, as I said before, so we write down, again, our Hamiltonian is a sum of Pauli products. This is because this is what we want to measure in the end. Then the computer thinks about a parameter space <coughs> or a set of parameters with which you can tap into the Hilbert space right here. That's done with a sequence of uh, operations where we have entangling layer, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, local operations, entangling layer, local operations, and so forth. And finally, the outcome is one uh, expectation value, which you measure according to what's needed for your Hamiltonian, of course, and then in the end you can just derive what the, you expect to see from the measurement and compare it what the computer had expected. And then you let it go round and round and round, and finally you find ground state, uh, uh, say, probabilities. We applied this here to the uh, Schwinger model. This is the Schwinger model in the so-called Kogat Soskind encoding, meaning that we know precisely where the particles and antiparticles reside, so this is a symmetry underlying the system, but we want to study how this works. This can be done also in a completely dynamical way in the Trotter Suzuki approximation, which we've done some time ago in this paper, but let me briefly show you what, how this works here. Remember, this is the way we tap into the Hilbert space, a sequence of the operations that I've shown you before, same color coding, and this is then the state that we realize and we measure. The best that we did was 20 ions, six layers of operations with 15 variation parameters. And the outcome is like this. This is what I refer to usually as the fly shit plot because it's very hard to interpret. Here are many, many points right here. This is the expectation value that we measure as a function of the number of the iterations. So we start here and then this is the final operation. What do we see here? Of course, the computer has to figure out where is the global minimum. You don't want to get stuck in the local minimum, so there's always a stochastic component that makes sure that you get out of a local minimum once you have found one. Second thing is, of course, you want to refine this afterwards. So once you're closer to what you really want to be, uh, you're searching in a refined way. In the end, what it gives you, of course, is steady state values. We are looking for uh, the expect expectation values in this case. So we're not looking for the dynamics in this approach. 
We could actually, in the Schwinger model for this problem, we can calculate it. This is the ground state for theory. It is the first excited state. So we can iteratively determine these energies. But more importantly, aside from the pure energies, we can also iteratively determine, say, the deviations from an energy value. The deviations from an energy value just tell us whether we found an eigenstate or not. If this is going to zero, then we're home free. So this is where we have some self-verifying procedure in our hands. This is now the final result, very complex for 20 ions. And you see that this is the average that we get. And uh, this is the fidelity with which we actually can do that and finally agrees with this. And uh, this is what we wanted to check. Uh, this goes hand in hand with theoretical values. The theory values actually coincide very well with what we have in our uh, experiment. And I don't want to dwell on this very long. The colors right here indicate how close we are and the optimal point. The critical question here is, of course, when do I stop? Since we cannot explore virtually every point in our parameter space, we have to make sure uh, that we have enough criteria where to stop. And the stopping criteria is just we have, have exhausted our resources. Of course, you can go on and search forever. You can calculate all of them. You never find the real minimum. We have to trust in our statistical value that this is close to, and this is what we find in the experiment. It's close to the ground state, but it's not exactly giving us things. It would be more exact if you search more and more. But this is what the system can give us at this time. And see, this is when it gets stuck in the local minimum, this is the final minimum, and the fidelities at this time are about 85% that we get for this problem. Uh, we can verify this, as I told you, I don't want to make a long story short. You can measure the variances, and as soon as the variances get smaller than the gap width that we have in the system, then we trust, yes, we have found uh, eigenstate, and we can rely on these things. Because it gets exceedingly difficult now with such a quantum computer to verify that what you've calculated is actually something meaningful. In the future, it will not be to calculate these things in theory. We have to rely on these stepping stones, have to make sure that the system actually does it. So verification and validation is still a problem. Let me just summarize at this point here. This variation in the quantum simulation is, of course, another way to do simulations to the analog one and now the, very, the universal one. This is a hybrid one. We need faster experiments. We can speed up the feedback loop. We can go to larger numbers. That's what we are doing right now. And eventually, we need 2D models. Keep in mind, this is very flexible. We don't need to generate the Hamiltonian in the quantum computer. It just lives in the classical computer. But it needs many repetitions, and you have to check whether that's worth doing for this problem at hand. And there are certain problems for this, for which this is really useful. I don't want to go and dwell on many other things. Let me just stop here and uh, summarize. Uh, does this work? It does. Let me just jump to this transparency. What is the dream? The dream, of course, is eventually that we come up with a real universal quantum computer. In the end, we will need logical qubits, which are protected against errors, actively protected using error correction. I didn't have the time to talk about that. That's a subject that Miguel Ángel and I are working on heavily to really do it, based on the theory that Miguel Ángel provided. We want to protect it, of course, using these procedures. And of course, we want to still have them interconnected. So we want to have, say, groups, in this case, five or seven ions, that are then talking to the next ones and the next ones in a large network. This is the dream that we want to have. Where are we on this? Of course, right now, we are not limited to 20. In the experiment, we have more like 60, 70, 80 available. And we already can individually address 50 or 55 of them. And we can use them for quantum computations. This is what's happening at the lab right now. But we need better fidelities, faster gate operations, faster detections. For this, you need many technical things. But it's not just pure technology. It's a lot of physics to be done. We need to develop of 2D, two-dimensional trap arrays, onboard addressing electronics. And an open question still is, and this is where the physics comes in, when we do that entanglement and we really want to have that speed up, how can we characterize the system efficiently? It's not known when we have a big system, say 40, 50 ions, how much entanglement is actually there and which ions are actually carrying the entanglement and how can we use it? Is it really? a system that can be used for full-blown quantum computation. This is not easy. And of course, the holy grail remains, as I said before. The error correction, that's what I call a qubit alive. This is the program that we have here. And then 
the applications are manifold. There's many things that we can do, and all of these things then become easier. Let me uh, tell you that this is a very large group. This is, of course, not something I did by myself. Of course, I'm happy to work with many colleagues to do that. This are the young people doing the work in the lab. And if here, is, here is a sample of my theory colleagues who really worked hard with that over the last years. Marcello Del Monte, Christina Muschik, Markus Heil, Philipp Hauke, Peter Zoller, Markus Müller, Michelangelo, Martin Legado, Joe Emerson, just to name the, the most important ones they have here. And of course, a number of sponsors. Here are some names. Uh, the names don't mean that much, but if you really want to know where we are, this is the home of the quantum computer in Innsbruck. Uh, this is the city of Innsbruck, this is where we are. And right now we have a company which is called Alpine Quantum Technologies. Now if you really want to buy one in the future, you can. This is the first quantum computer which is commercially available on the basis of what we do. This is the team that does it and here is the businessman, Thomas Mons. If you want to buy one, that's how it looks inside. Uh, just contact him, he will be able to help you. Thank you very much. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, Rene, for your very nice uh, talk from the bot from bottom to up. And now it's time for some questions if, uh, from the audience, students, or... Uh, thank you very much, and uh, congratulations for the recognition. Uh, after what we have seen, I guess that I, I, I can confirm that it will deserve. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm not an expert in the domain. But I'm going to try to summarize some of the things that I understood. Um, ask a question about some of the things that I would like a clarification. So basically, fundamentally, what we're saying is that, looking at the first slides, um, matter is important to see the density of computational capacity that you have. And we were pointing to, OK, are we going to be able to store bits at an atom level? Are but we, as, are we, going, to are we going to be able to store bits at an atom level? Yes. That was the initial. Um, um, uh, quote, and, uh, and, and the thing that I see it is, um, is not only about the matter, but the properties of the matter that you can use. Sure. And that, that just triggers everything. We are able to use more properties of the matter that we're going to use, in, and therefore, um, the density is much bigger. Uh, that's the way, the, dens the computational density is much bigger. Yeah. And then, the way to approach it, the way to engineer it, are different, and we have seen one approach, which is um, the ion trap approach. Um, I understand that, and that, that gives a, a lot of light. A question, technical question, uh, when we talk about local and global variables, so we understand the local being uh, in that chain that you showed, uh, the local would be the individual, and, and the global I, I, didn't, I think it's a sufficiently important concept, the local and global operations, for me to grasp it. If uh, you could just say, okay, what, what is a local and global operation? And then um, um, that, was, that, is, that, is, that would clarify me a lot of things, and that would be uh, one. And then in terms of, um, uh, because this was an approach, in, uh, asking about whether there are, there are other approaches that are promising other um, this one is the yes. European review. So That's a, there's a number of complex questions here. So the first question that you raised was the following. Is it possible to actually use a single atom or a single entity to store information? Yes, it's doable. Uh, and we can talk about the details later. The second thing is, uh, are there other approaches and how to do that? Yes, there are. Of course, I've shown you only the ones based on ions because that, of course, what we do. And it's a sort of an approach that I can just convey in one hour. Of course, whenever you have, say, two quantum systems, one here and one there, then you have to think about entangling them, superposing them. So you need something in between. Typically, what that in between is a photon, and you can use a microwave photon, say, in a cavity. This is what people do with superconducting qubits, transmons nowadays, or fluxmons. And uh, this can be done, and there are other approaches. They have, in the description, eventually, it's the same property, it's just written differently, and they have other things. 
but uh, in the end it boils down to the fact how many operations can I do within my coherence time. Superconducting qubits can do the same thing, it's about 10,000 whatever, that's the ratio. And uh, choose your poison and you have to live with it. My technology is the ions. They have the good advantage that all of the ions are identical. So if I want to put them in superposition or say entangle them, I can do this. I can make them indistinguishable. If you have artificial atoms like superconducting qubits or embedded qubits, say in CMOS or whatever you do, uh, then these things are always different. You have to artificially make them indistinguishable, which is a large overhead. Which one of the approaches in the end is more useful, that remains to be seen. Of course, most everybody thinks that uh, future uh, com com computers should work in the same context as, say, for example, uh, Intel, uh, Microsoft, and you know the big chip factories that do that because there's billions of uh, dollars and euros that went into these chip factories. But it's not necessarily the case because this is an alternative technology. AMO works in the same way. Uh, there's a bunch of questions that you have. You can discuss this offline. Uh, but these things have been asked and answered. Thank you. Uh, some other questions or comment? I have one with a more general view. I mean, you are <coughs> one of the, you've been in the board of the quantum flagship and now you are developing one of the big projects for a quantum uh, computer in Europe. And my question is, what do you think should be the role of Europe, the, the Europe, with respect in, in, in a world in which uh, we have uh, strong contenders coming from the private, private uh, institution, private uh, companies yes. like Google, IBM. What can we do as Europeans in, in this context? There's a lot to do. I mean, first of all, we have to remember ourselves that, in fact, most of the theory underlying things and most of the inventions were actually done and achieved in Europe. So we should not easily give this up. There's of course always the more applied sense and the applications that we see from across the pond in the United States or even in Australia and Japan and in Asia in general. So there's a number of things. First of all, we as Europeans should not be afraid of tackling these things. We need, of course, a strategic initiative, which was supposed to be the flagship initiative to a certain extent, meaning that we need to have a unified approach. What do we want to achieve? Quantum technologies are larger than just a quantum computer, which is pursued at this time mostly in the United States. We can make use of this for quantum communication, which is usually uh, approached mostly in China. They are just putting 15 billion, 15 billion within five years, dollars into quantum communication. We can use it for metrology, which has been underestimated as far as I see it at this time. If we enhance sensors, if you enhance metrology, like for instance yeah, your cell phone just uh, senses magnetic fields or accelerations, things like that. A car has more like a few hundred sensors, a plane has 200,000 sensors. If you can enhance these sensors by just a factor of two up to a factor of ten, you're home free. This is the industry, this is the market, and this has to be defined. What's further ahead, what is not so easy to get is quantum simulations. One simulation that I show you is, of course, are in its, in, it's in its infancy, but we can already see that with a slightly more complex system, say a few hundred qubits, even without error correction, we could simulate materials that you cannot really calculate easily. We could try to understand the dynamical behavior of light harvesting molecules. We could go for so many things in applications. This is absolute imperative. And finally, the holy grail, of course, as I said before, the universal quantum computer. But for this, we as the Europeans should, be, should come up not only just with a few agreements within the flagship. The flagship is fine. The initiative for the first three years that the states 130 million for, uh, for the development of some techni techniques. But then in the end, it's supposed to raise a billion within 10 years. But a billion within 10 years is 100 million per year. And keep in mind, the half of that has to come from the local governments and not from the European government. And then this is spread out over 27 states. This is not much, it's a trickle in, 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 as compared with what the US, what the Australia, what Asia, what others are investing. So what we need, and uh, as I told you, we have already talked to some of the European leaders here, we need a common view that this is important to pursue these things, 
at our own strategy. We don't want to rely on American hardware. I don't want to rely on communication systems that just come from China. I want to control this. We have this stuff. We have companies, we have people that can do it. We are intellectually able and capable to do this. So let's formulate that and just let's simply do it. At this time, there's too many fights going on and we are not really joining and unifying forces. It's unfortunate, but it takes a while. I'm all for discussions with this, but we need to go ahead and come up with our minds to do this. This is my five cents to that. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that point of view. And uh, is another question? Student? Yeah. Good, at least one student. That's good. I want That's to have good. students first, usually. Otherwise, I'm not allowing anything from us. Yeah. Seniors. Hi. Um, unfortunately, this talk was beyond my scope of uh, comprehension. I'm only in my second year <laughs> of the bachelor. That's fine. And um, I just wanted to know what people like myself who are interested in the subject can do in order to learn a little bit more. <laughs> there's, there's many interesting subjects. I hope at least the first half of the talk was uh, something that you could digest. It was not over your heads. Uh, that was intended to be there. If not, tell me. But the point simply is what we need to do in universities in general and you as students, we need to recognize that this world is quantum at its basics. And as students, especially when you do engineering, even in chemistry sometimes, we forget that. We take this as meta, as classical, everything is our classical world that we have around us. That's right, for most of us that's true. But the future will make use of the microscopic features. And we need to understand them. And we not discard them as something that we don't understand. The world is quantum. Let's make use of it. So try to convey that idea, learn it from heart up, and just think of it in, a, in such a way. We have so many new things to discover. There are so many new directions to do. And I'm sure here are the experts at Complutense to do this. Learn that, go ahead, and make it better. Thank you. Okay, I th think uh, we will uh, stop it here. And uh, let's thank uh, uh, Rainer Blatt again for his uh, nice and illuminating talk. Thank you, Rainer. Thank you.